In the mid-90s, our men's national soccer team was ranked in the top 20 in the world. Its decline since then has been a bitter pill. And not even the euphoria that came with our hosting of the FIFA World Cup in 2010 could prevent that slide. But could things have turned out differently? What if millions, perhaps even hundreds of millions, had been set aside for the development of the beautiful game, bolstering regional leagues and supporting talented young players? Well, as it turns out, that's precisely what happened. Well, sort of. So this is what it was called. It was called the FIFA World Cup Legacy Trust, a fund that would ensure, among other things, the sport's grassroots received vital financial support for years to come. That, at least, was the plan. Here's Govan. Twenty ten, a year of hope for a nation of soccer lovers. There was this dream that we would become among the best footballing nations in the world. A decade on, harsh reality sets in. I want to play for Benfica from Portugal. But in South Africa, I dream for playing for some nuns. You know, their style of play suits me because they use their wings more. They prefer those wings with pace, so I have pace. We're in a village just outside Zerist, and it's in places like these that the future soccer stars of South Africa are born. Playing conditions are dire for 16-year-old Kutrano Motswanyane, who plays for Rabalau clubs in the local football league. When we are struggling for money, we have to pay for transport, and coach had to make a plan for us. Hey, Coach Tabo. Coach Tabo Rabalau wants to nurture young talent. How's it going? It's about grassroots soccer. It's about getting the boys in the right shape of mind. It's about teaching them the football skills and, and life skills at the same time. Like so many young footballers, Kutrano wants to score big, but needs a helping hand. The 2010 World Cup yielded a guaranteed profit of 100 million US dollars from world governing body, FIFA. Of that, 65 million dollars, 450 million rand, went into the 2010 FIFA World Cup Legacy Trust, earmarked for development. FIFA had agreed that after the tournament, that uh, whatever money uh, was left, they would agree, once we set up a trust, that they will transfer those funds into the trust. A noble idea in the making, a forever fund for football, meant to leave the principal amount untouched while using the interest for development. And so it grew to just over 600 million. But this 600 million rand, it's not there anymore. It's done in 10 years. It's done. Finished. Ria Ledwaba, former vice president of SAFA, tasked with girls and schools development, also served on the Legacy Trust. There's no legacy, there's no money in that account. It's closed. SAFA received the bulk of Legacy Trust funds through grant applications for development projects. So what is the legacy from the FIFA World Cup in 2010? I can't show and say this is what the Legacy Trust has achieved. For me, infrastructure of the regions could be something that we are talking about today, but it's, it's not to be. By 2021, the trust had dwindled from 600 million to 40 million rand. It wound up the books and paid out what was left. When we were uh, taking a resolution to close the legacy trust, I personally requested, can we be provided with the statements from four banks? But before their final meeting, all SAFA-nominated trustees were dismissed, leaving a FIFA-led board. Ladwaba's access to the bank statements 
allegedly denied. For me, it's basically because we shouldn't know what, what's happening with, with the, the fund. The way the remaining 40 million was spent and the trustees removed made Ledwaba suspicious about how the funds were being used. Like the 13 million plus application for the regional leagues. Those regions don't know that there is an application that has been made with breakdowns. It's for transport, it's for prize money, it's for whatever, and that money never went there. Do you? know for sure yes. that those regions didn't get the money? 100%. I How are you so sure? It. Because I've asked in the NEC meeting, and I did, I did not get the answer yes. And I've asked some regions, and they were like, what money are you talking about? Of the regions we contacted, some said they had not received this money. Others referred us to SAFA. After our calls, an inside source received a message warning the regions not to talk to us. Those who did speak complained that even SAFA's monthly grants to them unrelated to the trust are deep in arrears. One of the many signs it's juggling a cash flow deficit. Former CEO of SAFA, Dennis Mumble, has the inside track. You have a situation where those debts that are most urgent uh, need to be paid first and, and usually those are for outside service providers and your internal constituency usually bear the brunt. With SAFA in financial trouble, the trust is alleged to have become a handy piggy bank for SAFA's commitments. So, which entity got priority when Danny Jordan was both SAFA president and Legacy Trust chairperson? I was originally approached by one of the trustees of the Legacy Trust who had concerns in terms of the way the Legacy Trust was wound down, whether there was any risk exposure to them. Bart Henderson is a forensic investigator targeting government and private corruption. I extended my own mandate. I started looking more closely at SAFA because that's where money from the Legacy Trust went. In recent years, SAFA has grabbed headlines for allegations of match-fixing, alleged rape by its president, Danny Jordan, which he denies, and the recent Banyana Banyana standoff. Contractual issues must be dealt with earlier. And various claims of maladministration. Critics slam SAFA for its bloated 47-member National Executive Committee which, unlike England's efficient 10-member board, incurs hefty extra costs that go beyond their annual allowances. I started realizing there's a problem. SAFA's in a mess. In a 44-page high-level risk report, Henderson highlighted a decade of concerning incidents within the organization, sharing it with SAFA, FIFA, and the Department of Sport, Arts and Culture. He received no response. Until, that is, Safa laid defamation charges against him. What the high-level report is, is the terms of reference and the purpose and scope for a full forensic investigation. The red flags are popping out all over the place. Henderson's biggest concern Safa's purchase of the Fun Valley Resort outside Joburg for 65 million rand, funded by an 82.5 million rand Legacy Trust grant. Its aim, a world-class training center. I was informed by Jordan, you go and finalize the deal, because now it will become Safa's property. As CEO, Mumble says he felt pressured by Jordan to go ahead with the 65 million rand property purchase, despite a lower valuation. That valuation indicated that the market value of the property was between 30 and 35 million. The owner was not prepared to negotiate, as the resort was a going concern. The deal went ahead. Welcome to the Safa National Technical Center. That's what the sign says. It was meant to be a world-class training facility, but most people still know it as Fun Valley. 
and we discovered that back in 2015 already, it was going to cost about 600 million to complete the place to make it functional. Even after some improvements were made, the highest valuation that Mumble got was 44.5 million rand. Uh, that's the sewage treatment plant for the city of Joburg. There's a cemetery here because the Avalon Cemetery in Soweto is full. It is very busy here. At the perimeter, we managed to get a glimpse of two of the three pitches. What you see here, this is the artificial turf that was laid by FIFA. And then there's a natural turf, but it doesn't look like it's in very good condition. Perhaps the facilities are more impressive inside. Jordan had promised that the technical center would cut Safa's costs and boost its income by hosting national teams and attracting holidaymakers. I was called by the Banyana Banyana when they were staying there, and they, in no uncertain terms, told me that we are sleeping here for the last time. Every time we sleep, we must put our bed on the door uh, because we don't know who's going to come in there. A sharp contrast to the minimum facilities that had been pledged for the 38-hectare Johannesburg site. Safa's 2022 financials reveal a substantial loss of around 5 million rand on the technical center. If Safa wanted to buy Fun Valley, why did the Legacy Trust end up funding it? What does that say to you? The revenue that has moved from the Legacy Trust to Safa has had a material impact on its bottom line. Without that 65 million rand asset, Safa's viability was at risk and its constant applications for funds to cover its soccer development obligations and additional initiatives, the Fun Valley project, one of the largest, ate at the trust capital by over 400 million rand. Could I say that definitively the Legacy Trust funds were plundered for theft or, or for the benefit of individuals? I don't think so. I think the situation arose due to bad management of SAFA over a sustained period of time. While starving soccer development in the regions. Just look at our pitch. It tells you the story that we don't have nothing. Just look around, check our field, you can see. It's a struggle, brother. It's a struggle. In Mahikeng, Northwest, coach Junior Morake leads a promising local female team. Yet every day, he feels he's on the losing side. Have you asked the region why they're not sending any money through or helping with any kit or transport? I've never asked them. Why not? Let me tell you something, brother. You know, football, football is cruel. You ask something, it's like we are fighting. Fighting it's with like who? We are fight with the leaders. Of the region? Yes. You think the problem is at a regional level? I think everybody in, 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 in South Africa, they know the route, where it started. How can we, at grassroots, be okay when the head is not functioning well? That's my question. You're talking about the, the president, Danny Jordan? I talk about whoever was in charge of Sava. They must just look back and check where they come from. Have they done something for their community? Are they developing the young ones? So is the World Cup's only legacy a trail of mistrust? Until Danny Jordan is out of SAFA and that, that organization is restructured properly, SAFA will still be where we are today, t 10 years to come. Whistleblowers are determined to challenge Jordan's control. Ex-SAFA NEC member Malisela Mwoka has lodged a criminal complaint against him for theft, fraud and wasteful expenditure including issues around the Fun Valley purchase. All the projects that were funded with that 600 million must be audited from cradle to grave. But by the same token, the trustees of the Legacy Trust also had their own fiduciary duties. Your duty as a trustee is to protect the integrity of the trust. SAFA is refusing to respond to these damning allegations. They say that's because some of these claims are subject to litigation until the week of our broadcast, when Jordan called to say Safa wanted an interview, immediately followed by a text saying that the trust had unqualified audit reports. His lawyer confirmed with our producer minutes later. They folded me 
the list of questions that you sent a few days ago. And the position is that we would like to offer you an opportunity to meet with us during the course of next week. But then they changed their mind. I've gotten proper instructions from clients now after having looked at your questions. And, um, the questions are all surrounding the FIFA legacy trust. Correct. What you must remember is that trust was a FIFA trust, it's not a SAFA trust. It's a SAFA FIFA trust, that's what Mr. Jordan no, texted. It's a, it's a FIFA trust. I'll give you Mr. Jordan's exact words. When did Jordan give you words? He gave words to Govan. He says the Legacy Trust was a joint FIFA SAFA trust. Let's agree to disagree. Citing legal action against Bart Henderson, they turned down our interview, directing us to FIFA. Hold on, FIFA Hold would, on. would be able to answer the question as to when the last 40 million was wound down and those... FIFA ran, FIFA ran the trust, so they are the perfect people to go to. We wrote to FIFA. They said that activities and projects funded by the trust were submitted and reviewed by the Board of Trustees, and compliance and auditing measures were in place. The trust met its objectives and was closed down in compliance with South African law. And that was that. But then another twist. We obtained a confidential document put out to the regions, the 2010 FIFA World Cup Legacy Trust Closeout Report dated 2022, sent out on the eve of our program. It showcases the trust's achievements, but fudges on the detail. Only around 230 million of the 600 million rand is itemized with actual values. And headline projects are highlighted when the trust was not the main contributor. A glowing report, but not a full account. And no apology for closing its doors especially to grassroots footballers. It's really frustrating. We are sometimes wondering what is it that we need to do or why is Safa not investing a lot on grassroots because that's where we unearth this talent. I want to play overseas just like any other player out there. Yeah, but currently from the area we are from, it's hard for a player to find a rich professional. As the final whistle blows, the only legacy that remains is loss. A loss for football at its very heart. Well, Govan joins us now for more on what is a complex story. Govan, great job on that. We heard from Safa's lawyers last week. They say, look, this was, this was a FIFA trust. It wasn't their trust, is that accurate? Well, it was registered as the 2010 FIFA World Cup Legacy Trust. But Danny Jordan himself called it a SAFA and FIFA joint trust. And then importantly, it was dominated by SAFA members on its board while operating. It had three representatives from FIFA. The chairperson of the trustees was Danny Jordan. There were a number of SAFA executives who were making decisions about the Legacy Trust. So even if you accept that, they then say but it did do what it set out to achieve. Well, they've only accounted for items up to 200 million. This was, importantly, meant to be a forever fund. That means it should have still been operating and helping players at the most local level develop their talent and move up the ranks. The fact that they had to close it down indicates that they failed to make it a forever fund and they failed to ensure that it continues helping grassroots develop. Because the money was never meant to run out. It was meant to operate with a capital base and then use the interest. In perpetuity, and they originally got 450 million rand, the interest made it grow to over 600 million. That indicates that it was working, and if they allocated from the interest, they should have been able to keep the development going. Of course, we found that didn't happen. So, I, what do you say to those grassroots soccer coaches those people who work in their little corners of the country with no one paying any attention to what they're doing to try and uplift communities, that this money was actually there. They have a few astroturfs. They have some kit. 
but most of them are still struggling. And the only thing you could say to them is that you have to fight for your rights within the regional leadership of SAFA and hope that your re regional leadership speaks up at the NEC meetings of the South African Football Association, where Danny Jordan is the president um, and still has a lot of influence. Is really to our right that the whole structure needs to be revamped? Well, Ria Ledouaba believes that's what needs to happen based on her tenure as vice president at SAFA. Based on the people we spoke to, there does seem to be a need for a relook at the SAFA NEC. Whether or not that will happen is less dependent on people like Ria Ledouaba in those big positions and more dependent on the people in the regions, the soccer guys across the countries who are in charge of these leagues. But they're being sold a particular story, a particular narrative. I mean, what do you make of that last minute update on what the trust actually achieved? Clearly an attempt to show that what they're about to see this week is not really what happens. But the kicker is that the people this report was sent to are the regional leaders, the ones who are overseeing leagues that are in a state of disarray, who get constant complaints from clubs, who can't afford kit, who have to take money out of their own pockets and sometimes beg from community leaders for transport. So we doubt that that will be fully believed. But I suppose if you're sitting at regional level, you're partly dependent from those higher up. How much then can you challenge them? If you're willing to risk losing your position in the SAFA NEC, you would do that. We've seen a number of regional leaders take a stand and confront the leadership of SAFA, demand that more money goes to the regions. But at the end of the day, the ball is in their court and what they do with it will depend on how desperately they need those lucrative yeah. positions. We keep scoring our own goals, don't we? All right, so could our men's national football team ever return to its former glory? Let us know your thoughts using hashtag carte blanche. Thanks for watching. Why not drop us a comment below? We love reading your opinions. Remember, you can now access carte blanche stories anytime, anywhere, even offline. Carte Blanche, the podcast, is now available on all major podcast platforms. So be sure to hit that follow or subscribe button and be part of our growing online family.